So I'm already 90 seconds late, so I'm going to have to really get going. Uh, so we finished with the template instantiation guides. Um, nice example of how we might use them with vector. Interesting point that we didn't actually get this early enough so that the standard library added this to vector. So this is what I was saying. We're out in the ballot comment period time. I filed ballot comments suggesting, hey, this thing saying this is the motivation for doing this. Let's do this. Structured bindings is um, another late breaking feature that I expect is going to be really popular. The idea is so I've got a function that returns multiple values and I want to declare a bunch of variables that are the result of breaking down those multiple values into separate variables. So the syntax is reusing all of our wonderful tokens. Auto, square bracket, x comma y, introduces two new variables, x and y, that will bind to the result of dereferencing, in this case, map.find. So it's two, first and second of that pair. Uh, what does the restricted binding syntax work with? Functions can return any aggregate. So if I've got a, a C style struct, uh, I don't need to do anything extra. That will already just bind correctly as long as I provide the right number of identifiers for the new variables I'm declaring. Um, I can return an array by reference, and it will therefore initialize the same number of variables of that type or something that supports the tuple protocol, where the tuple protocol has not yet been nailed down properly in the library, but the intent is this will all be smoothed over and cleaned up by the time 17 goes to print. Uh, so the idea is you're, over, you're providing specializations for tuple size and tuple element, and the get function in order to retrieve the element out of the tuple using those values. But it does mean that array, pair, and tuple out of the box already support those types. We've just not given you the user the rules for how you can customize your own types to specialize those traits. And it also works anywhere initialization may be performed. So this was a fun one I had figuring out to draw the slides. You can, if I've got a map using a for loop, I can use auto reference, give me first and second from the map. And I've now got first and second variables directly usable within the map. You notice I've used an auto reference to make sure I get references out, and it means that I've got a const reference to first and a regular reference to second. Has include is a little tool we're putting into the preprocessor. That it's an extension in several like, popular compilers today, and people wanted it in the standard for a while. So here's my classic example of I'm trying to use the file system header. I'll see if I can include the file system header, and if so, great, namespace fs is standard file system. Otherwise, I'll see if I can find the experimental file system header, and if so, great, namespace fs is the experimental file system header. Otherwise, last gasp, I'll see if I can find the boost file system library. And I'm missing the .hpp on boost file system, so that's a bug on the slide. Uh, if I can include that, great, I've now got the boost file system is my namespace fs. Otherwise, yeah, I'll give the user an error. I couldn't find the file system library. This code's probably not going to work. Language tweaks going on. Um, one that was requested, uh, going back at least as far as C++11, we finally get, is the ability to open a nested namespace. So a namespace std colon colon file system, I don't need to op op independently open both namespaces, which is nice because it means I can close it with a single curly, which is fairly handy when you're trying to write these things in macros. Not that we like writing many macros. Uh, initialization in if clauses. Um, I thought this was a particularly dubious feature until someone gave me the classic motivating example and now I love it to bits. Um, basically the idea is it's aligning a pair of curly brackets. You're not writing anything you, new that you couldn't write before, but it is just so much neater on the page. Similar to the idiom of where you would initialize a pointer with a dynamic cast inside the if, in this case, I'm going to take a lock over the, con the body of my function call. So if lock garden mutex LK, LK, I get my lock. But the test I'm going to do once I've acquired the lock is v.empty. And if the thing's empty, I'm going to do my pushback. So I acquire the lock before doing the test, but I've got a scope of my if if block and the else for that, um, for that lock. Uh, another simple small cleanup for static assert. Um, often if we're using good class names with good identifiers, the thing that we're testing is clear enough that coming up with a separate 
string literal to describe the error. It's frustrating, it's annoying, especially if you're writing a lot of these, especially if you're writing test drivers. So just having the static assert string guys that text like it would with a regular assert is a popular little feature. So we can now omit the string literal and it will just string guys the, the text of the code. And obscure little corner at the end that this is significant if you've been following what's happening with the ranges TS. And if you've not, you'll find out again in another three to five years. But the idea is a range doesn't need to have now the begin and the end iterator be the same type. I can have some kind of query that when I'm querying it against the end, as long as I, whatever I'm testing with tests with the first iterator type, I can have a, a simpler sentinel type at the end that is very useful in some kinds of ranges, especially input ranges. So this is an idiom that we're propagating all the way through the ranges TS, which is coming from the library in the medium future. In the meanwhile, we put that support straight into the, the new range base for loop. So if people have loops that are returning, functions that are returning ranges, they can drop them into the loop. Uh, an ob obscure corner, we're clarifying explicit default constructors. As I said, I'm going to show you everything we've done in the standard. Um, the, the final bracket, ZC is equal to empty braces. Is this supposed to work, is it not? The standard was ambiguous on this. And it turned out, having gone around the various alternatives, that making that ill-formed is the one that seems most consistent with the way explicit constructors work elsewhere in the language these days. So that was cleaned up, and that actually simplifies an, an awful lot of library issues that were hanging on this specific core feature. One of the more contentious things we were dealing with at the end was nailing down an order of evaluation of expressions. This has long been a corner case for bugs in C++. You know, I++ plus I++ is not well defined. Um, optimizer folks love to claim this is a really important corner where they can get the most out of the language. And folks learning the language, especially coming from other languages, have undefined behavior in the programs that they're not seeing. And this is, we, we don't like that confusion. So we came to some kind of a middle ground where the operators of the lab, the, the standard operators, so plus, minus, and so forth, are all going to have a clear, well-specified order of evaluation now. Um, function call operators, so the order I evaluate the expressions within a function call. So A, B, you know, I'm calling F with A, B, C, D, E, the evaluation of A, B, C, D, E are now all indeterminately sequenced. There is progress since C++ 14 where they were actually unsequenced and therefore I could have da arbitrary data races or interleaving of instructions between any of those evaluations. Now there is going to be a sequencing, but whether it's left to right, right to left, or any random permutation, you don't know. That's known only to the compiler vendor. Uh, there was a desire to make that left to right. You might read about people saying it should be left to right. Um, we had some feedback from some optimizer folks who implemented that and said, yeah, we, we were doing right to left before, and when we switched to left to right, we're getting this much of a performance penalty and we don't want to pay it. So certainly as far as 17 is concerned, we're not nailing down the order any more than uh, indeterminately sequenced, but there is now at least a sequencing there to eliminate further kinds of awkward corner case bugs. It also means that when you overload an operator, the overloaded operator, when it's called, will have a sequencing between the evaluation of the two arguments that will be quick consistent with the underlying operator, which finally means you can overload operator comma to do what the built-in operator comma does. So quick example, um, x equals y plus 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 y plus plus is now well-defined. It means I'm going to increment y and then add that to incrementing y in exactly the order you see. Uh, whereas if I call a function f with y plus plus comma y plus plus, it's no longer undefined behavior. It's going to do something and that something will be well defined at the language level. But you don't know which values of the first, those two arguments will be because the order of evaluation of the two y plus pluses you don't know. Ongoing language tweaks. I think this is the end of the, the language now. Um, we've got this funky function coming into the standard library, which is effectively a function that does nothing, so it should be a, a no operation, 
but it gives information to the compiler regarding the lifetime of objects. The, in particular, obscure corner cases, when you're building some of our more advanced data structures, you get into corner cases about type safety of the language. Let's say, okay, I'm going to destroy this thing in place and recreate another thing on top of it. And how that interacts with the lifetime rules of the language, you just need to give the compiler a hint so it doesn't say, ha ha, you've gone into undefined behavior the way you're abusing the type system here. Standard launder says, we're about to do something funny. Mr. Compiler, you're not allowed to optimize on the assumption that we weren't allowed to do that. Um, and if you never hit what those corner cases are, thank you, you're in the 99.5% of C++ developers who never need to know about this. But when you're trying to build some, da some data structures, a classic example would be a flat map where I'm trying to resort my elements in my vector, but I've got a, con a pair with a const key, so I need to somehow swap things with const keys. I need to play funny games with the type system, and those games will probably involve calling standard launder to keep it all well-defined. Const counts isn't enough. Um, final corner, the memory allocation of over-aligned data. So when we call operator new, I can do new with a, um, you'll spot this is the arguments for the new operator prior to passing the arguments to the constructor. So it's like doing an in-place new, I can do a new with a size and an alignment using the new align val t enum class. And those are the full set of the core language changes. So just in time to start on the library. The SA is significantly larger in terms of page count. Hopefully will go fairly quickly because libraries are much easier to summarize because as soon as you go into depth, you've suddenly got this much to talk about. So I kept trying to talk about this much. Um, starting with the multi-core support. Um, we've got these two terms we've been throwing around. I'll just make sure that you're all on the same page that the standard committee are when we talk about these terms. Parallelism is the idea of using multiple execution units to perform the same computation as quick, a single computation as quickly as possible. I'm farming out lots of tiny parts of the same computation and collecting them all again at the end. Okay, yep, I've got my result. Concurrency is multiple threads of execution doing different things at the same time, so that you know, we get to the end when the last of those results is already. Oh, it's a good way of re reducing latency. It's very useful when you're doing lots of um, asynchronous processing, but it's you know, a different kind of set of idioms, and usually different goals than parallelism, just trying to accelerate some, one specific thing as much as possible. So we now have const expert is always lock free. Um, for your, your atomic types in the standard library, you can query if they're lock-free or not. But prior to C++17, that function itself wasn't const expert, so it was a runtime dispatch of your code. Now with, it, with const expert, the compiler could optimize that away, and with if const expert, you could actually go down different branches of logic entirely. So making that const expert is actually fairly handy. We also have two new values that are const expert integers or size t-types that aren't terribly meaningful to me because I do not work at this very low level, but this is coming straight out of the folks who are working directly with familiar hardware. So you're writing games for the PlayStation. You've got a very good idea of your target. The idea is these are describing the cache lines of your CPU. So the compiler itself at compile time needs to know the cache lines of the target that you're optimizing for. But if it can do that, you're going to get values here that are going to be very useful. Otherwise, it's going to give you its best guess values and your logic of using those will be as good as the guess is. But the, for really high throughput applications that are really sensitive to cache lines and specific hardware that can know the hardware they're going to be running on, these can actually be incredibly useful. So also on the concurrency side of the library, C++14 we added shared locks. C++17 we're adding shared mutex and a variadic lock guard. So the idea of the variadic lock guard is, I'll say here's three, four, five different mutexes I want you to lock. Make sure that you acquire them in the same sequence every time. Which should resolve a, a potential risk of deadlocks that, uh, with s some kinds of code. One of the big, changes, big progresses is we're adopting the parallelism TS which is adding parallel overloads for many, but not quite all, of the standard algorithms. So what happens is all of the algorithms in basically the numeric and the algorithm header, where we can, 
we're adding an additional overload where the first, temp first parameter to be deduced will be an execution policy that describes or gives permission to the algorithm to make further assumptions that allow it to optimize uh, its algorithm and dispatch using multiple threads or uh, vectorization instructions, other execution units. We're not providing parallel support, oddly enough, for algorithms involving random numbers because parallel random numbers are still a very interesting research area. I mean, I can provide parallel guarantees on a single thread, but as soon as I go across multiple threads, does each of those threads see the same quality of random numbers? Is the overall distribution across the threads also going to be good and random? That's a tough topic to go into, so we're just not going there. Uh, heap operations, other than querying is heap or is heap until, are not going to have the parallel overloads. Anything involving permutations, as going from permutation to permutation, tends to be a fairly serial algorithm. Um, and again, these other algorithms I've got in orange do not get parallel support. We do add to the numeric header four new algorithms, uh, exclusive scan, inclusive scan, transform, reduce, and reduce. That uh, th Some of these are familiar with, if you're familiar with the term map reduce will be making sense. Inclusive scan and exclusive scan. I'm not particularly clear what they do, but these terms are the terms of art used by the high performance computing parallel community. So if those terms resonate with you, they're probably what you think they mean. When I look at the word scan, this wasn't doing what I was expecting. So read the spec if you want to know what they do. Changes since the TS was first published, which is basically the last year, now we have forward progress guarantees that I spoke about in the memory model back at the start of this talk. We're applying those to describe the progress guarantees on the parallel algorithms themselves. Um, the execution policies were renamed to be something a little bit simpler, because you're going to be using these frequently enough. Um, and the behavior when an operation that the user supplies throws an exception has been changed to try in the TS, we tried to have a notion of an exception list. So we could accumulate a variety of exceptions and then throw an exception list object you could somehow retrieve the exceptions from without ever documenting how you would populate that exception list yourself. Now, as we're promoting these up to the main standard, it becomes important that the users writing their own parallel algorithms can interoperate with the standard algorithms in the same way. People know the framework. And if we can't populate our own exception lists, that's going to be a problem. But further, even as we tried to nail down what this meant, we were seeing lots of problems with the formulation and ex expectation of an exception list in the standard. So the policy has changed just if anything of a user supplied operation, so anything from one of your functors or the increment operator on your, um, on your iterators or trying to dereference the iterator, if any of these operations throws, the whole parallel algorithm would just call terminate and bring the process down. And that includes when you're calling with the sequential execution policy. So an algorithm with the sequential execution policy is not the same as calling the equivalent algorithm without a policy. And this is not an accidental oversight. It's deliberately by design, because the idea is trying to debug parallel code is difficult enough. Switching to a sequential execution model of the same code, having essentially the same idiom and se semantics, is very helpful in tracking down the debugging. If this is suddenly propagating exceptions rather than terminating, it's not having the same behavior. So the main reason that the sequential policy here is a debugging aid to serve its purpose, it has to terminate in the same way. All on the math side, we incorporating the separate IS that we created around about 2012 based upon the, library fun the original library technical report uh, we had 20 or so mathematical special functions in there. So Bessel functions, beta functions, the Riemann zeta function. If these terms resonate with you, you'll know all the goodies you're getting. If they don't resonate with you, going to research these things is probably not going to help you. This is fairly obs obscure mathematics unless you're up at graduate level math. Um, there was a desire to incorporate those in C14 that or even C++11, but there were concerns about the cost of implementing these and bigger concerns about the cost of supporting these. You don't want to have somebody on the hotline who's got to answer, I've got a bug report on your Bessel function. Is your guy on the technical support phone capable of dealing with that? But 
there's been sufficient demand for these now coming from certain scientific communities that the idea of maintaining two standards and the free availability of reasonable, reasonable to good quality implementations of these functions, we've finally folded them into the main standard itself. Uh, we're also grabbing, on the smaller scale of things, a three argument version of the hypotenuse function, yay. Um, so we can do three dimensional as well as two dimensional triangles. Uh, greatest common divisor and lowest common, least common multiplier. And we're adding a sample function. So we will, over, over uh, the range begin end, we will write through the output iterator a, a number of samples using a specific random, uh, random generator. In the realm of vocabulary types, vocabulary types are the kind of thing that you want to use in your interfaces. So vocabulary types work really well when there's very few of them. If you've got seven ways to describe the same thing, you're going to need an exponential combination of APIs when things start interoperating with these ideas. So the more we can get common vocabulary into the standard, the more interoperable libraries will be that use the standard vocabulary. So we've had pair for a while, this is really you know, a simplified version of tuple, so we've already got a bification of our vocabulary there. And we've got standard array. So we've got pairs, you know, a container of two types. Tuple is a heterogeneous container of n values, and array is a homogeneous container of n values. We now have the idea of optional, which is I've got a value or I don't, which is clearly, you know, it's a type that's been wanted for quite a while, with people have been getting around this by perhaps using pointers, but then who owns the thing that the pointer's pointing to, and you end up with lots of awkward code trying to manage the lifetime of these things. So standard optional is the primal vocabulary for expressing a result that either produces something or doesn't. Uh, standard any is the vocabulary type. It's a container for one of anything. As long as that thing is copy constructible, any can hold it. You'll notice it's not a template, it's just a regular type that holds anything that's copy constructible. The fun comes when you want to take the value back out, but we'll get to that later. Uh, variant is kind of like optional, it's a container of one thing, but in this case, it's one of a sequence of types. So I've got a bunch of types, it can hold one of them, and it can tell me which one it's holding. Unlike any, which can hold anything, which is a much larger set of types, but I don't know which one it's holding. And the other vocabulary type that's been coming through is string view, which is a reference into a string that doesn't actually own the string. It's much more lighter weight for passing around as a vocabulary type in a lot of interfaces. So, pair and tuple. Every standard, we have a new way to clean up and break pair and tuple. So, C14, we added the ability to retrieve an item out of your pair or tuple with get of the type rather than get of the index. So I've got a tuple of, in this case, an int, a standard string, and a double. If I call get the int, it knows I wanted to get the one out of there. If, on the other hand, I had two ints, it would be ambiguous and the, the call would fail to compile. In C17, all the constructors for pair and tuple are now what we're calling conditionally explicit. Now, Explicit constructors were an interesting thing in C++ 98, but only meant something useful when you had a single argument. When we expanded the rules for brace initialization for C++ 11, explicit constructors with multiple arguments suddenly acquired a meaning. And that was unfortunate for Tuple that had made its multiple argument form explicit on the grounds that that might be a single argument and we didn't want the implicit conversions there. Trying to resolve that issue run through a variety of design choices, but the, the one we've come down to is, if my initialization of that tuple with that set of arguments would hit an explicit constructor, then that same constructor of tuple should be explicit. So the, inher the explicitness kind of in inherits up from the elements of the tuple itself. But it's specific to that form of initialization, so we've got a converting constructed with many parameters, it checks each of those individual constructions and says, if that's an explicit constructor, then that constructor will be marked explicit, otherwise there's no explicit there. This is a joy to implement, as you can only imagine. 
No, we have no language support, and no, the core folks have no interest whatsoever in jumping down this rat hole to give us language support. But once you kind of got the tricks, it's, it's fun, a fun problem to solve and a painful one to keep implementing. Um, one of the other things we can do now is we can, for a long time, be able to pack function arguments, for example, with make tuple into a tuple. We've not been able to go the other way and unpack the arguments into a function call or a functor call. So now we have the apply function to say, here's a function, here's some arguments packed in a tuple, unpack them and call the function with the unpacked arguments for me. I believe it was actually sitting around as an example in the C++14 standard, and that exact example is now just the definition of the library. Um, and finally, uh, similar to the apply function going the other way, we can construct um, an object by unpacking a tuple, so this is the equivalent of apply for a constructor. So kind of like make pair or make, um, uh, make shared or make unique, you, you specify the type of thing you want to construct. So I've got a tuple using the the, the new funny constructor deduced type syntax, auto tuple one, one, two, three. And I can then, why I can make from tuple and say I'm going to make a my type. I've got to specify the, the type in the angle brackets, but it will then unpack the tuple to the appropriate constructor of my type. Optional. So this is the idea of a type that's going to substitute for t and behave exactly like a t if t has a value. Um, the default constructor is going to go into the empty state, though, so I don't have a value. Uh, the reason I say it behaves exactly like T is when you get to the overloaded relational operators. Classic example, I've got an optional double, and the double holds a NAN. The standard way that the library has so far approached defining the six relational operators is you define equal equals, and then not equals is the negation of equal equals. So if I do equal equal on an optional double holding a NAN, it will say, yes, yeah, false, you know, and, and NAN doesn't equal itself. Okay, does it not equal itself? Under the old rules, it would not equal itself because it's the negation of equal equals. But if I'm holding a NAN and pass directly down to the NAN, operator not equals also returns, no, I don't equal myself. I neither equal myself nor do not equal myself. I'm a bizarre thing, I'm a NAN. So optional T, forwards all six relational operators down to the underlying T rather than synthesizing them the way we've always done in the library in the past. And this was a, a really contentious design call, but the fundamental idea is no, optional T is really intended to stand in for the original T, so it was important that it had these semantics rather than we invented something else to go along with them. From that, we need to say, well, where does the empty state order, and yeah, it's less than all the others, and yeah, you, you access the element by dereferencing it as if it were a smart pointer. That makes it relatively easy to drop, substitute in existing code that has been using pointers to represent this kind of idiom in the past, especially going through you know, functional interfaces. Next one of our vocabulary types, we have variant. This is an interesting type in that this didn't go through any of the TS processes. It came in, it was, just missed getting into the Fundamentals 2 TS. It was a slam dunk for Fundamentals 3. But given we're having all of our other vocabulary types shipping in this standard, and a huge amount of time was burnt getting this design right, um, there was a real desire to ship this in the same vehicle. So Variant has come all the way up the process and is shipping in C++17. In particular, there was a strong concern that shipping any without Variant would lead to people overusing any in interfaces where Variant was the right answer. So the idea of variant is, it always holds a value. This was one of those, again, an important awkward design question that can variant have an empty state? Um, code is a lot simpler if I never need to worry about the variant being any. I can just you know, visit it, query it, and it will always have a good answer. Uh, but there's a cost to having a never empty guarantee. And that cost typically consists of double buffering, because if I'm reassigning a new value to the variant and the reassignment fails by throwing an exception, how do I get the original, val or the original value back? Typically, I would have that in a second buffer, and I would just translate between the two, but that, so that I've always got a good state and can just transition one way or the other. But that now means I'm paying twice the space overhead for my variant than I would want. 
or I could allow for the fact variance can be empty and therefore I always have to query the empty state worrying about my, that in addition to all the other states in the variant. So people banged on this really hard in terms of design. And it was seen that the majority of types that users want to store in these, as long as they've got a well-defined no-throw move constructor, you can always temporarily move away the object and you've got a guaranteed ability to move it back. So it's common for implementations to be able to eliminate the empty state, the, 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 the need for the empty state and not consume extra storage. But in those rare cases where users do give us these awkward things that throw, we've now introduced this valueless by exception state, which isn't a state you can, you can construct directly. This is why it's different from actually having an empty state in the vector. It's not something in the variant, sorry. You can't request it. But you need to be aware that, yes, variants can enter this strange valueless state if an exception is thrown at a particularly awkward time. If you want to program against the never empty guarantee and assume it doesn't happen, most of the time you'll be correct. And I liken this to programming with doubles and ignoring the idea that NANs might be in my data set. The majority of the time I control things well enough that this isn't going to occur, especially if I'm writing non-generic code so I know all the types that are in my variant. But in generic code, every so often I might have to worry about this and then I've got the empty state and those algorithms will just be a little bit more complicated to implement than I might have intended. So other obvious things, so I can, I can either access by type because variants hold things by type, but we're also allowed duplicate types in that set of types and therefore I can access by index, so I'm whatever the third type was. And we have uh, sort of variant size and variant element, I think, where the equivalent of tuple size and tuple element, so I can introspectively query what types a variant can hold. Uh, similar to a C++ union, the default constructor is going to value initialize the first of the alternatives in that type list, as if that were the first element of a union. Um, and again, in a manner similar to the optional library, it's overloading all six operators as if trying to forward them to the underlying operation between the two, the elements held in the two variants. But first of all, we check if they've got the same index. And we'll order by index before we order by, okay, I've now got two things I know they're the same type, so I can now just do the query on the operation for those same types on the assumption that operator exists. If the operator doesn't exist, the whole comparison for that variant is going to fail regardless of what type it's holding because that's a compile time constraint. Standard any, as I said before, can hold any copy constructible thing because it's going to dynamically allocate a copy of that thing essentially on the heap. Uh, we might have some small object optimizations if you try, start passing in integers and so forth, but mostly if you're storing something in any object, you've got a dynamic allocation and it's copied onto the heap. And if I make a copy of the any object, it makes a copy of that thing on the heap so both any objects have their own copy. If I want to get something out of the any object, I've got to know what type that is. And then we go, we query it with the any cast function, which is kind of like you know, the, the funny dynamic cast we have on smart pointers. We've now got any cast as a, a way to try to retrieve the item out of an any. I can retrieve it by reference, any cast uh, to an int ref, and if my any holds an int, I have an int ref. If it doesn't, it's going to throw a, a bad, any ex bad, bad any cast exception, I think. It throws an exception. And um, conversely, I could try and retrieve it by pointer. In that case, I'll have a, a no accept guarantee, but it will just give me a null pointer if the cast fails. I can also query the type ID of the object that's held, but there's not a whole lot you can do with a C++ type ID. That might give you a clue as to how the API is implemented, though. In particular, it will not do base-derived conversions for compatibility and pointers for you. It's got to be an exact match. In the world of text handling, uh, we've now got basic string view, which is the analog of basic string. It's kind of like um, a const string reference. Um, given that everyone seems to agree that uh, it's a real shame that basic string has way too many functions, we want to use this as a drop-in replacement for basic string in many functions. So it has the same way too many member functions. It's basically got every const qualified member function of basic string. And it's got a couple more that allow you to shrink and grow the range 
that you're viewing over on the underlying string. The idea being it's your job to make sure you don't go over the bounds. So shrinking is easy, but if you're trying to grow the range you're viewing, it's your job to make sure you don't go out of bounds. Uh, we also have a faster string searching network uh, framework using the Boyer Moore algorithms. The idea here is I'm going to have um, a large, I'm, I'm trying to search for a common string across lots of different bodies of text. So I can effectively construct a small finite state machine to describe how I would search for that string to say, okay, once I've searched, I, I'm actually first seven characters, but not the last, the eighth one failed. I know I can usually jump seven characters in the underlying sequence unless there's some um, common subsequences, which might mean I jump a, a smaller amount. So it's a handy way of repeatedly searching for the same string in many different bodies of text. Um, minor fix for basic string, we've got a data member function that only had a const overload. So we now allow the non-const overload so I can pass the contents of a string to a, an underlying C API on the with the understanding that I'm not going to try and change the length of that string. In particular, I'm not allowed to overwrite the null, terminating null. I can introduce other null bytes because strings are allowed to have null values, but the terminating null should not be overwritten. And final thing in the purple, we've got a high performance number string parsing library coming in. Um, this is in pink because when we came to apply those edits to the final standard, it didn't apply cleanly. There were a couple of minor issues that were picked up in the, the interface there. So we're sending it back. Um, well, we're, we're filing comments to say it was meant to land, but the editors weren't in a position they could merge it cleanly. We expect that to be cleaned up, and that is still expected to be a part of C17 when the actual standard is published next year. File system library is our last large TS that's being landed into C17. So basically, we're adopting the TS as was published around about the same time as C14 and resolving a bunch of defect reports that have come in over the intervening three years. Uh, the specification is based on the POSIX standard to define the notion of a file system and what it means to navigate a file system and all the operations on the file system. It doesn't mean you have to have a POSIX file system underneath, but it does mean that you've got your, the file system that you're using should hopefully have a fairly clean mapping to the POSIX semantics so that this library can be layered on top. One of the big concerns that was reported against this and did give us some pause about whether we were correct to adopt this at this point is that we have no protection against data races at the file system level. So make a file, you know, make a temporary file name, now open the file name. Somebody can, you know, forge things in the middle. There's an opportunity for uh, an attacker to do a man in the middle kind of attack on your code. So this is not intended for that kind of application where security is a real concern. If I'm writing small applications to, you know, to mine my own, oper my, my own machine or m many common uses where security is, I'm within a con constraint where I don't have to worry about that, it's more than good enough. But please be aware, do not use this, op this library thinking you're going to not be introducing any, using this library is going to introduce potential security holes in your code. Be aware of that concern. Um, it uses the system error reporting, the system error exception handling, uh, ex exception categorization that we introduced in C11. And all the new facilities that come from the file system TS are added in the STD file system namespace. I'm not going to exhaustively enumerate them all because, as I said, this is a quick catch-up of the kind of things we have. So a quick categorization and a few things that changed since the ETS. The basic class is file path that you will notice is a regular class. It's not a class template like basic string. It's a class that can traffic, its constructors will take a regular string and a wide string. And now that we have them, but also a string view and a wide string view. Um, on top of that, we've added a lexical API for decoding relative paths. So I say it's a lexical API because we're doing operations purely on the string names themselves, and we're not querying the operating system to say, how do I best map from this path to this other path, which might have to deal with things like um, symlinks and so forth, resolving through those paths, might be able to find shorter resolutions, or not find a canonical re re resolution. 
Um, so the key things that we get from the file system API are functions and iterators that allow us to navigate a file system, and then the corresponding operations that us create, delete files, and directories, and symlinks, and so forth. Uh, type traits library. Type traits is a popular library if ever you're doing anything with templates, because the idea to introspect and guide your template res algorithms accordingly is uh, usually too, too, too much to pass. So, um, in C++ 17, or C++ 14, we added a bunch of alias templates for all the type traits that computed and returned types with an underscore T suffix that were often substantially easier to use because you didn't need to have the type name when you used them, and it was, it was just a nicer interface. So, for C++ 17, we're adding something similar for type traits that returned a value where we're using a variable template with a, a corresponding underscore V name. It's not clear that these are as useful, but when I implemented my own version of the type traits library, um, I found that code working with the Vs, especially as I made the Vs actually my primary definition and the, the type trait and alias to, almost to the uh, trait, just turned out to be much cleaner in use because I'm not jumping between type-based representations of values and actual values in the language. The code just somehow read more cleanly. But it, it's not so clear it's as big again but it is a nice consistency to have throughout the system. Likewise, bool constant is our new alias for integer constant of bool. Um, again, I was not very excited when this came in. I started writing code using it, and it just looks so much neater and cleaner, and this is a lot of what we're getting from 17 code written idiomatically, and I just feel simpler and cleaner. Um, when I was talking about the fold expressions earlier, remember I said that even though we got short circuit evaluation on the expressions, you've got to instantiate the whole fold before you can do that evaluation, and that might fail to compile. We've got the conjunction, disjunction, and negation type traits that are effectively doing a similar kind of thing of, you know, conjunctions is all the and, disjunctions is all the ors, and negation is just the, the appropriate negation as a variadic pack expansion. But these are written in such a way that we have um, a lazy evaluation of the template part expansion. So if, the, if I can compute the result and determine what we know with an and or an or after expanding the first two or three that I've got the result, I no longer need to expand the whole parameter pack in case any of those expressions might in turn fail to instantiate. So this is a safer way in generic code, potentially, of working with the same kind of ideas but it's also going down your template recursion depth in the way that a fold expression might not. So, different trade-offs. Uh, one of the embarrassing things in the C++14 library is we've got all these type traits that, all these, sorry, functions in the standard library that have no except operators that would be importantly querying is your swap operation no except. This was not at all a problem for the standard library to implement. And it meant that we wanted your swap you and your swap functions to be able to decorate your swap functions accordingly. But because we're relying on you doing an ADL lookup on your swap, you can't do an ADL lookup in a no except operation. Because there's no name lookup in, there's no way to get the using ST, namespace STD in there in the first place. Now the standard library is written in namespace STD, it never saw the problem. So it turns out it's actually really important to be able to have a query, not so much the is swappable trait, which is handy, but the is no throw swappable is something that users could not write to put in their, accept, their no accept specifications on their functions. So we finally added those to the standard library. Um, is callable is a missing invoke related trait. Invoke is this funky language we have in the standard when we're trying to invoke or call an arbitrary function like thing. So it could be a function, it could be a functor, it could be a pointer to member function, it could be a reference to one of these things. There's a whole variety of these things, but if I can pass a comma separated list of things between a pair of parens and it's going to go off and invoke and call some code, this is the set of rules to follow. So we're exposing that set, a function that follows that set of rules. That I say it's more general than just calling the function operator because uh, it handles pointed to member functions and so forth for you, as the is callable function. It has unique object representations. I missed the S for a long time. 
simply says that all the bits used in this object representation con are part of the value. There's no padding bits, which means if I have something that has this trait, I can therefore use things like memcomp in order to test if two things have the same value. So when I'm dealing with a large range of these things, I can transform to usually much more optimized low-level algorithms. And finally, we've got a new transformation trait alias called void t. This is a very handy um, trick built around this for doing compile time introspection to say, you know, do you have this particular member and therefore create a spin out constraint around that. So if what I'm saying there makes sense to you, go off and look this up, it's fantastic. And if what I'm saying makes no sense, then you do not need this. It's an awkward corner that solves a really awkward syntax problem in the library, or in, in libraries in general. Um, I'm assuming everyone in the room knows what I mean when I say Svinai. If you don't, I'm sorry. These last few slides are probably not going to make a lot of sense. Um, but we had a problem in C14 that Svinai, well, people would use the result of type trait, and it would end up dropping into a context where we would really need it to say, well, if I don't have that overload, I want to go and pick another one. It had to drop out of resolution correspondingly, but there was no primary definition of the result of type trait. So code would fail to compile as a hard failure in the wrong places. So we require the result of trait to be an empty class if it's, uh, if it's not going to be defined appropriately. A primary, we basically give a, primary de a definition to the primary template. And we've done the same thing now for iterative traits and common type. So these can also be used safely in code that would be wanting to query these things in, in a Sphenai like context. Smart pointers, because we all love to keep working on our smart pointers. Um, there were some holes found in the kind of conversions that you would do with a unique pointer to an array. Uh, that might end up in, you know, losing the fact it was a unique pointer to an array and calling the wrong deletes and so forth. Um, you had to jump through some hoops to get into those holes, but we found those holes and we closed them. Um, shared pointer of array of unknown bound was supposed to have been added to the um, CD along with, uh, which is the shared pointer analog of the unique pointer functionality. Um, this was imported from the library fundamentals TS. And by the time we were doing that, it turns out we'd also already made quite a bunch of changes to shared pointer. So the project editor didn't have an easy way to do the merge. And then we accidentally forgot about that. So that is intended to be landed in the C++17 that we publish next year, but it's not in the current document that went out for ballot. Uh, standard ownerless with a funky diamond. Um, in C++14, we have all these diamond functors that are a cute way of having the function call operator of that class template be a deducing thing more like a polymorphic lambda where it will deduce the arguments of both types and then apply the operator accordingly. Uh, so we found another standard library functor that didn't have this particular tweak that we added in C++14. We've done it there. Re-enabling shared from this is something I would really not like to talk about because this is just evil and should never happen anyway. But if you're in that crazy land where you want to have multiple shared pointer owner groups, so I've got a shared pointer over here that thinks it owns pointer X, and a shared pointer Y over here that thinks it owns pointer X, but they have different control blocks because they've got different deleters that are going to do different things. Typically, one of them is going to delete and destroy X, whereas one might just be calling a function with it that's going to assume it lives beyond that. So, hey, don't be doing this. <laughs> But if you did that, and the types you were using used the shared from this mechanism, you quickly fell into undefined behavior. So we've defined how these shared from this is rebind when you construct these objects and found the corners of undefined behavior and ruled it out. So this crazy thing you shouldn't be doing is mildly less scary because we've defined what it does, and I'm not sure that was a good thing. But yeah, it, when you start going and po poking in dark corners of the standard library, it's surprising somebody's already been there and cleaned them out for you in advance. And finally, shared pointer weak type, just so we can get the, the weak pointer analog of the current shared pointer I'm looking at if I don't actually have immediate access to the, uh, the, the type parameters. Allocators in C++17, a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, we've got a new trait to simplify our use of 
and we can specify a lot of the exception specifications dealing with allocators. So standard allocator, it's a stateless allocator. So any two allocators of this type are always going to compare equal. They can always inter interchange memory. But there's a lot of code that is required to query that at runtime in order to figure out if I can swap or so forth. Uh, which meant that lots of code that should have good, clear exception specifications that say, I know this thing can't throw, uh, couldn't do so because it couldn't have queries as a compile time property. So we now have the is always equal trait that defaults to, I've got an empty type, it's a, state, a stateless allocator, probably is always going to compare equal to, it, to other allocators of that same type. And that lets us give much better exception safety guarantees and especially exception specifications throughout the standard library. Um, the other thing we've done is we've incorporated the polymorphic memory resources from the uh, library fundamentals TS. Um, which I've got in more detail on the next slide, so I'm probably just going to jump straight through. Uh, the idea is standard PMR memory resource is an abstract class. It's not a class template. It's a straight class that will, when you implement the derived classes, they just give you memory of appropriate sizes. So we're taking the type out of the allocation framework. And by making it a base class that does the allocation through virtual functions, you can now pick your allocation strategy essentially at runtime. So we provide a few standard resources. So there's a default memory resource, which is the memory resource you will use unless you request a specific one through this API. The new delete resource, which just delegates everything down to operator new operator delete, which is the default behavior for the default resource. And the, handy, the ever handy null memory resource that always throws whenever you try to allocate. It can never allocate. Uh, which is a handy one to have the end of a chain of, of resource adapters adapting different strategies. Uh, and again, we put three actual useful strategies in there. The monotonic buffer resource is an, a resource that basically you give it a buffer and it will just allocate memory from it as it goes. It never reclaims the memory. The, the delete function just says, yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing. And then if you exhaust that buffer, it will dynamically allocate through an, an additional allocator you allocate resource you supply when you construct it or the default if you don't. Uh, a buffer twice the length and then continue allocating through there. Simple strategy, very handy for trying to say I want a small buffer on the stack, so I'll create a, a small stack object there, allocate out of that and hopefully never need to go out to the heap for memory. Uh, the synchronized and unsynchronized pool resources are a more familiar strategy where we're going to bucket things based upon the size of the allocation. When I hand the allocation back, I'm going to keep that in my bucket and therefore I've got a free list of allocations of the appropriate size. Uh, but this does mean because I've got separate pools now with different resources, I can have more localized pools for different memory subsystems within my overall system. And that has a surprisingly good effect on cache locality these days. Uh, then we have the resource aware version, memory resource version aware of those containers. So PMR polymorphic allocator of T is the allocator that works with allocator traits that wraps all those memory resources. Um, then within each container header, we have a new container alias that is simply an alias for the existing container using the polymorphic allocator rather than standard allocator. So SDD PMR containers allow them, uh, the versions that can use these type erasing allocators quite, quite efficiently throughout the, the system. Other changes for containers. We've got non-data member, sorry, non-member functions versions of data, empty, and size that are common across a few of the containers. Where am I on slides? I have five minutes to do seven slides. I'm gonna have to really accelerate, that's a shame. Um, we have minimal incomplete type support for forward list, list, and vector, which basically means I've got a recursive data structure like I'll struct X, and it's got a data member that's a list of X. While I'm passing X, X is an incomplete type. So if I've got a list of X, I've got a list of an incomplete type, but as long as those operations, when I call them or instantiate them, see a complete type, we're going to be good. And it turns out all the existing implementations of standard libraries could support this guarantee for those three containers. When you start getting into the more node-based containers, not all of them could give that guarantee today, so we didn't want to go further than we knew we could guarantee. Um, Another minor change, the sequence containers have in place front and in place back containers. 
uh, functions are great. I've just constructed something. Where'd it go? So they return rather than void, like they used to return in C14. In C17, they will directly return a reference to the thing they've just constructed because they had that reference standing around, standing around anyway. For associative containers, ah, ignore the last bullet because it's on the next slide. Um, so we've now got the default order um, lookup um, type trait that effectively says, this is the way I want you to order my type by default. And we can drop that in where the default is call standard less, which will call the operator less than. So by dropping this in, we've got a customization point so that if I want to customize my type, say I've got a complex number type, I do not want to define the less than operator for this type, nor do I want to abuse the standard less functor that is supposed to be the function like analog of calling operator less. But I do want to be able to store my type in sets and as keys of maps, because I can define an arbitrary ordering that's good for my type, it's not the mathematical ordering. Uh, default order gives us a customization that will do that while being 100% ABI compatible with existing code because it's a lookup through a type trait for a default template parameter. It produces exactly the same type for all the existing code. Um, when it comes to trying to insert things into unique key maps or unordered maps, we've got the problem that if the thing's already there, the insert's going to fail. And how do we deal with that? There's different optimizations you can do container side to make these kind, you know, try and, try and then place this or insert, or if it's already there assigned to it, much more efficient than trying to do them purely outside the container, so we've added those methods. Um, funky thing about splicing is extracting a node from a container. So, um, the idea is I'm going to, I've got a node that's been allocated by my container that holds whatever element. I can extract that node out of the container then either splice it into a different container because it will just sort correctly without having to do another allocation, or I can perhaps fiddle with the key, which is where I was talking about standard launder earlier. You occasionally hit these strange corners where you want to do funky things just outside the strict rules of the type system, change the value of the key, and then try and insert it back into the same container. Again, I don't want to allocate and it will now go just to the right place. Uh, one of the problems this does solve is that with a set of unique pointers in C++, 11 and onwards, we've never been able to actually take elements back out of the set. I mean, I can erase the element that's in the set, but I've not been able to move the unique pointer out because I only ever had access to a const iterator effectively, or an iterator with constant access. So that's another thing that this extract interface will let us do. Um, finally, we've got these funky, um, a bit too small to read on the slide, hopefully you'll be able to see them more clearly. Um, when the slides are published, a bunch of algorithms for working over uninitialized memory to do a construct in place or a destroy in place or a move in place. Um, we have a, a small subset of uninitialized algorithms that have been sitting there since C++ 98. Uh, there was a real desire from the folks on the gaming community and other high performance, low level library managers that want to really to enrich this facility to, to encompass all the behavior. So we, that has finally been broadened in C++17. Small library additions. Uh, invoke uh, a callable thing with a bunch of arguments. Um, as const is just a simple, it'll give me a const reference to the thing. So all those library functions like C begin, C end that we've done all these different overloads, I could just call as const and then begin. And it's just a more general thing rather than having to create lots of separate named functions all over the place one that just gets us to the right place. Uh, clamp is the classic, I've got a minimum and a maximum, and I want my value to be bound within that range. Uh, the generalized negator not fun I mentioned earlier. I'm already 15 seconds over. Uh, const expert is more broadly spread throughout the whole standard library in the list of places there. And final library cleanups, um, Reference wrapper is now guaranteed to have a trivial copy constructor and copy assignment. No, it doesn't have an assignment operator. Um, for the chronotypes, we now support abs, seal, floor, and round. And finally, we're reserving for the future all namespaces that start STD followed by a sequence of digits. We are looking, probably not for C++20, but hopefully not much beyond that, to have a new standard library namespace that we're going to want to start populating with a, a a more consistent standard library built up from the kind of features we've been talking about today. So 
You're on notice. We're reserving those, all of those namespaces for future use. Thank you.